Hi everyone, welcome to another Sunday Zoom meeting. I am back from my holidays in beautiful Italy. And um, today, um, I thought, I mean, we've been masterclassing what forgiveness is for the last number of weeks. And I thought we would take one tiny bit of the forgiveness process to really, really masterclass it today, because it's the most important part. And it's the part that you're going to keep forgetting over and over and over and over again, because I do as well. <laughs> and it's the part that makes all the difference. And we're going to explore it from three um, different points of view. Uh, one is a forgiveness opportunity I had whilst I was on holidays, and the other is two different forgiveness opportunities people have asked about in the group. So we're just going to really explore it in detail based on those three different perspectives. You know, um, whenever we talk about forgiveness, um, whenever we talk about anything to do with the course, here's my problem, what do I do? It's always the same answer. <laughs> Jesus says you have one problem, which is that you have made a, a, a decision for the ego instead of the Holy Spirit. And there is one solution, which is that you undo that mistaken decision for the ego, and that automatically joins you with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so, it you know, <laughs> every time someone asks me a question, I just give a variation on a theme. It's the same thing over and over and over and over again. Um, but the problem is the mindlessness. Um, so remember, you know, the one apparently separated son of God, um, um, you know, that, that, that mind consciousness split into wrong minded consciousness, which says this is real. I'm a separate thing. And the right minded consciousness, which is the Holy Spirit that says what thing, what separateness. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, you know, as the story goes, we we chose the ego's interpretation. We went separateness is real and we buried the Holy Spirit in our mind. And then, of course, a split mind will just continue to split. And so this, you know, we've made a decision for the ego. Now we think we are the ego. And now we're stuck with this um, truth as we see it, uh, which is that heaven was destroyed and God was attacked so I could be a me. This one me, this one separated son of God. And um, and a solution was devised, which was to make up a story of sin, guilt, and fear uh, to validate this existence as a separate thing. Because if separateness is real, God has to have been attacked. There's no question about it, because this is not oneness anymore. There's a me. Um, and so this story of sin, guilt, and fear was manufactured by us to protect separateness uh, from the Holy Spirit's correction. Um, and so the sin is what we have done to God. And the uh, guilt is the inevitable feelings that we have based on what we've done. I say we, it's just one separated son of God at this stage. And then fear is the fear of God's retribution in the future. What I've stolen from God, this separate identity, he's going to come back and steal it back off me um, in order to restore oneness. So that's sin, guilt, and fear. And we made that up because the separation never happens. <laughs> but we needed a way to protect the idea of separateness. And so we made up the story of sin, guilt, and fear. But this, <laughs> the guilt was intolerable. And so um, we needed to do something in order to um, to not have to live with that guilt, which no human mind can contemplate how awful that guilt was. That we have attacked the fountain of all goodness and love, beauty in the universe. Uh, you know, we've committed patricide in order to be a me. You know, it was me or God and he had to go. And, and and I made that choice. Um, I destroyed heaven so I could be a me outside of oneness. Um, so um, that guilt is intolerable. And so the idea is let's split again, let's split the mind. Let's split off that terrible guilt inside of me. And let me, um, and that's what happens, the mind splits. <laughs> and now I see the guilt that was in me as the one separated son of God, which you all are. Um, and I see that guilt that was in me in a, in a separate self, this split off part of me now. 
And now I believe myself to be the innocent victim. And this other self is this victimizing, cruel self that's coming after me. And we think it's God. And um, and now we need um, a new strategy, <laughs> which is to get out of Dodge, to get away from what we think is God, because we've forgotten it's the split off guilt from ourselves. Um, and so the world is made. And this one separated son of God shatters himself into trillions and trillions and trillions of pieces and apparently projects himself out into the world. And the goal is to become mindless, to forget that there's a mind. That's the goal. So the, the reason for that goal is to get away from God because God's coming for me in my mind. I have to leave my mind and forget our mind. I must become mindless. And so the one separated son of God makes a world and apparently projects himself out into the world. And each part, you know, as the son, um, apparently becomes a body and an individual self, the mind is forgotten. Now I think I'm a body and I'm here because of what two other bodies did. And I am this separate self. I am this insane voice talking to itself in my mind. So that's the mindless state. And that's what the one separated son wanted. To be bodies and mindless, thinking it is the body. <laughs> and the insane separate self talking to itself in its mind, thinking it's a body amongst other bodies. So that's the mindless state. Um, and so why, oh, why is this part of forgiveness so hard to remember? Because of mindlessness. Because over and over and over and over again, we're going to forget, I am not a body. I'm free. I'm still as God created me. And the self I made is not the son of God. Nothing it says or does means anything. It is unreal. Nothing more than that. So we're going to keep forgetting that and identifying as the mindless thing and being mindless. Um, so this is the one thing everyone keeps forgetting. That's why I coined the term ego's Jedi mind trick in the, in the Facebook group. And, and basically the ego's Jedi mind trick is this mindlessness, which is that you will keep forgetting your mind and thinking you're a body and an insane voice talking to itself. And then you'll read something or experience something and go, oh my God, yes. And then it, you'll go mindless again. <laughs> over and over and over again and so do i um so that's why repetition is so essential in terms of the course okay so i want to um talk about this aspect of forgiveness so i want to take two kenneth wapnick quotes to begin with and the first is the function of the miracle is not to have us stop choosing our egos it is to have us be aware that we are choosing the ego. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. This is what gets almost all Course in Miracles students way off the mark. Then they will believe that they are choosing the Holy Spirit when they are not doing that at all. Because they think that choosing the Holy Spirit is the goal of the Course. The goal of the Course is that you choose the miracle which means that you finally understand what you are choosing and then you learn to forgive yourself for continually choosing your specialness. If you do that, what you have done in effect is let Jesus look at your ego with you. So let's just take another quote before we talk about these. So this is also from Ken and it says, it's not about letting go of grievances. You don't want to let go of grievances. It's about forgiving yourself, about not wanting to let go of grievances. That is what the holy instant is. At first glance, <laughs> what Ken is saying seems to fly in the face of what we would think of as our forgiveness process, and even the way we've been talking about it in our sessions here. Um, because we have been talking about 
realizing we're identified with the insane voice talking to itself in our minds um, and falling back to be a witness of the insane voice talking to itself and our guilt coming up and to look at that with Jesus of the Holy Spirit and um, join our perception to them. And the minute we identify as the self that looks and not the self that's looked at, all of the upset is undone forever. So at first glance, it seems like what Ken is saying is different. Okay. And, and this is the key thing I want to zero in on today. Um, and it's this. <clears throat> How best to put it. Um, Okay, so we have two selves. We have our separate identity, my ego identity, the self I've made that is not the son of God and nothing it says or does means anything. It is unreal, nothing more than that. <laughs> okay, and I call that separate self Keith. And you all have a different name for your separate self, the self you've made that's not the son of God, that blocks your awareness of yourself as the son of God. So very crucially, I am not saying I don't exist. This is the mistake people can make. Okay. What we're saying here is my identity is spirit and my activity of imagining and believing myself to be a separate self called Keith is veiling from me my right-minded identity as spirit. So to be very clear here, we are not saying you don't exist. We're saying you are, you are not what you think you are. And because you continue to believe you are what you think you are, that blocks from your awareness, your identity as spirit. So we have two selves and we have that self. Um, and that self is the decision maker joined with the ego, the belief in separateness. And, um, and Keith is a manifestation of the ego thought system. Okay, but the decision maker can make another choice. I mean, the entire course is Jesus saying, you think you are a body and you think you are an insane voice talking to itself in your mind, but you're not. You're choosing to identify as that, an illusory identity that's not you, and you can choose differently. That's what the whole course is about. So the other choice that we have available to us as a decision-making mind is um, the Holy Spirit, the right mind. And Ken always defined right-mindedness um, or the decision-maker joined with the Holy Spirit as a non-judgmental observer. A non-judgmental observer of your ego. Other spiritual paths call that awareness. Some call it the noticer or the witness. It's the same thing. So you have two identities. You have the one of a body. <laughs> a physical and psychological body. And then you have another identity which is capable of being a witness to those bodies. And that isn't those bodies. So we have a split mind. So both minds are always present. So let me tell you about a forgiveness opportunity I had when I was in the days. <laughs> Because uh, I think it should be nicely illustrative. And then we'll also talk about it from two other people's um, experiences with forgiveness as well. So um, when I was in, this was in Florence, um, we stayed in a hotel. And, um, and in the morning time, it was breakfast. <laughs> and I was having some cereal and my husband was having some cereal. And we realized, oh, there's no milk. So <laughs> the lady who's kind of there and looking after everyone says, um, oh, milk, is it? And we went, yes, expected to be handed the milk. But that's not what happened. Something sort of weird happened where she poured the milk into our bowls for us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we just held our bowls and she just poured it into the cereal. I was like, that was a bit weird. But anyway, whatever. We have milk. It's all good. Um, and then she, uh, like every other hotel and bed and breakfast in the world, there was like a coffee machine where you press a button for 
you know, latte or <laughs> cafe macchiato or um, Americano or whatever else the case may be. And she went, what coffee do you want? And it was, she took a cup and she pressed the button and she made that for us. And we took our coffees and we sat down. Um, and then she was also the receptionist. So she then disappeared and everyone had the breakfast and it was cool. And I was like, oh, I'd love another coffee. So I went, okay, right, like, so I'll do what I did in every other hotel in the world that I've stayed in. And I went to the machine with a cup and I pressed the button and the coffee came out. And then the, um, so the lady in question comes around the corner going, yes, 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 yes. What, what do you want? What do you want? And I was like, uh, just coffee. And she, this is not self-service. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> Okay, straight away, I was fuming because <laughs> I was like the bold schoolboy who had done the bad thing. And um, and so I so I did say to her, I went, oh, well, if it's going to be like that, you should really put a sign up so people know that and, you know, don't get themselves into trouble about it, I which she ignored. <laughs> and um, OK, so that happened. And I went, OK, here's a forgiveness opportunity. Now, I'm very used to um, being able to fall back and, you know, into the awareness I am in the Holy Spirit um, for, for small things. Right. So I tried doing that on this and. And it wasn't working <laughs> because all my mind would say to me was, well, I'm totally going on to TripAdvisor and I'm telling this story to everyone. Um, and then I was going, no, he's just supposed to be forgiven. <laughs> okay, back to forgiveness. Let's try that one again. Uh, then it was like, um, you know, well, tomorrow when I'm having breakfast, I'm going to say, would you mind pressing the button so I could have a coffee from me? Uh, and then I was going, no, Keith, that's not forgiveness. Okay, you got to fall back. Anyway, so I was kind of, you know, um, going, okay, this is not working. I'm not <laughs> letting this go. Um and, and this is the trap everyone's going to fall into, right? Over and over and over again. And I still fall into it. Um, so have a think about what's my mistake. And my mistake is I'm identified as an ego, Keith, and I am attempting to do forgiveness as the ego. That's the mistake. And that's the mistake everyone's going to fall into, okay? Um, that's the mistake. I have one problem, which is that I have misidentified as a separate self, Keith. Um, and there's one solution, which is undo that mistaken decision to be an ego and join with the Holy Spirit as a non-judgmental awareness. But th this is the part we want to master class today, okay? Um is that we don't try and do forgiveness as an ego. If we do, we're going to get very frustrated, feel like a failure, feel like the course is impossible and there's no way I can do this. That's that's one possibility. And the second possibility is that we are going to totally fool ourselves that we're doing forgiveness and all we're going to accomplish is forgiveness to destroy, where I, the separate self, am now forgiving what has happened because I am a holy ego. Um, that's as good as it gets, right? The Course is asking you to forgive what never happened. And a separate self can't do that. So it took me a little while to realize I had fallen for the ego's Jedi mind trick again. Um, I had fallen for the mindlessness trap, uh, trying to do forgiveness as the mindless thing. As Jesus would say in the Course, I was trying to bring truth to fantasy and understand truth from the perspective of fantasy and ego okay so so and this is what ken is talking about with his two quotes um again if we have a look at them in the context of what i've just said it's not about letting go of grievances you don't want to let go of grievances if i'm identified as a separate self there's no way in hell i want to let my grievances go it's about forgiving yourself for not wanting to let go of grievances. That's what the holy instance is. Um, now that seems like I'm letting myself off the hook. <laughs> and, <laughs> which is why it seems like what Ken is saying is different, but it's not. The course process is um, 
looking at how much you don't want to forgive something um, with no judgment of yourself, with forgiveness of yourself for not wanting to forgive it. And that's how you forgive it. That's the strange paradox of it. Okay, so if you're trying to forgive it, and then you're getting frustrated, feeling like a failure, and I'm a bad course student, and this is not working, and I can't forgive it, and the course is impossible. I don't know how anyone's supposed to do this. Uh, that's the mistake. Instead, what you do is you forgive yourself for not wanting to forgive it. And now a completely different non-ego presence is in your mind. The right mind non-judgment you know forgiveness isn't a thing forgiveness is a frame of mind and that's all i have to do is introduce into a situation is forgiveness now as ken is pointing out i am not going to want to forgive the woman with the coffee <laughs> okay so instead what i'm doing is i'm forgiving myself for not wanting to forgive the woman over the coffee and now this beautiful, um, forgiving, loving, non-judgmental presence is in my mind. And so I forgive this choice to be Keith, to be this separate self that's been aggrieved for as long as it takes until I automatically let go of identifying with the separate self Keith and instead identify with this lovely, forgiving, non-judgmental, <laughs> gentle presence in my mind. And when I do, the upset's gone. So again, the really important point Ken is making is that, you know, if I am feeling upset, there is only one reason why I'm feeling upset. And that reason is because I'm identified as an ego. I think I'm a separate self. And the guilt of that separateness is awful. <laughs> and so it will be denied and projected out onto a world uh, where I will see that guilt outside of myself instead of within me. So the first thing to understand is that if I'm upset about anything, anything, I am not upset for the reason I think. I am not upset for the reason I am blaming for the upset as an ego. So when I got upset about being scolded like a schoolboy in a hotel I would paid a lot of money for, um, I wasn't upset because I was getting scolded as a schoolboy in a hotel that I had paid a lot of money for. I was upset because I was identified as an ego. And that plunged me into the guilt and self-loathing of egodom. And then I needed to find fault with the world instead of with myself to distract from my self-hatred, which is what projection is. So I'm never upset for the reason I think. Whatever I'm blaming going, you did this to me, you put this feeling in me, I was fine until you came along and did this, that's a lie. I'm never, ever, ever under any circumstances upset for the reason that I think. It's projection. I'm upset for one reason, which is that I'm identified as a separate self called Keith. And the self-hatred is appalling. And then as this separate self Keith, I have this appalling self-hatred and guilt and self-loathing and sense of inadequacy about myself. And then as this ego identity, I make demands on the world. This is how people should behave towards me to, so I do not have to look at how much I hate myself. That's what egos do. That's why Jesus says, do not hate your brother, because he will not take the part you've assigned him in your dream. And that's what I did. So being identified with Keith is all this unconscious hatred. And then as Keith, I'm going, people should be polite to each other. People should not 
scold their customers like both school boys um, in order that I don't have to feel this self-hatred coming up in myself. Okay, so that's what's going on in the situation as an ego. I now need to manage the world so it doesn't make me feel how crap it is to be a separate self. And so when that lady didn't behave in the way I had assigned her in my dream, um, all my self-hatred came up. All my um, inadequacy as a self came up. But instead of looking at the fact that this was already inside of me, uh, projection is automatic and it gets denied and it gets projected out. And I go, you did this to me. This, you know, this was inside me because I'm choosing to be a separate self and the guilt is awful. Um, and then projection means I will pick situations in the world and go, you did this to me. You're the reason why being a separate self is awful. awful. You're the guilty one, not me. Um, so, so eventually I will always remember <laughs> I'm doing forgiveness wrong. Um, I'm trying to forgive as Keith. And um, and that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness um, is not Keith forgiving anything. It's me stepping back from identifying as Keith. And once I'm no longer separate, the upset, the guilt, the self-hatred of being separate is no longer present. It vanishes. Because I'm not separate anymore. I'm not identifying as the separate thing. I am what's with Jesus in the cinema. I'm not what's on the screen. Now, this is where people can tie themselves in a knot and go, well, this being with Jesus, and I don't know about this like other self, and I don't know if I can experience this other self. All you have to do is look at the fact Okay, as Jesus says on the course, let's find a quote here. So this is from chapter 27, um, section 7, paragraph 2. Now you are being shown that you can escape. Okay, we can escape from the ego's world. All that is needed is that you look upon the problem as it is and not the way you have set it up. So to say that again, all that is needed, nothing more is needed, is that you look on the problem as it is and not the way you have set it up. How could there be another way to solve a problem that is very simple? And this is every problem you ever have. So how could there be another way to solve a problem that is very simple, but has been obscured by heavy clouds of complication, which were made to keep the problem unresolved? Without the clouds, the problem will emerge in all its primitive simplicity. Again, this is every problem that you ever have. The choice will not be difficult because the problem is absurd when it's clearly seen. No one has difficulty making up his mind to let a simple problem be resolved if it is seen as hurting him and also very easily removed. Okay, so again, Jesus is talking about every single problem you ever have because they're all the same. You have one problem, which is your decision to identify as a separate self, as an ego identity, the self you made. And there's one solution, which is to undo that mistaken decision to be an ego. So what is this problem Jesus is talking about? All that is needed is that you look on the problem as it is and not the way you've set it up. Well, the problem as it is, is that you've decided to identify as a separate self. The Holy Spirit's nowhere near you. <laughs> you've thrown him out of your head. You've gone it alone. I am this separate mm -hmm. self. I am this insane voice talking to itself with all its likes and its wants and its needs and its stories about who it is based on the past and everything else. 
Um, that's the problem, the way it is. I have chosen that. The guilt of it is enormous. I have projected it out onto the world and I'm only dying for someone to step out of line so I can go, you did this to me. You're the guilty one, not me. So again, applying what Jesus is saying here to my own situation, um, my problem, uh, as I set it up, was that I was a perfectly happy separate self, <laughs> insane voice talking to itself. Um, and this person had come along and treated me badly. And now I had all these awful feelings going on inside of me. And it was like, you did this to me. That's the way I set it up. That's why we made the world. So we could set it up like that. So we could keep our separateness, but somebody else is to blame. The guilt is in someone else. It's not in me. That's why we made the world. That was the purpose, to keep our separateness, but not have the guilt. Because I will see that in other movie characters outside of me, apparently. So if I'm looking at the problem the way it is and not the way I set it up, now I look at the fact that my one problem is that I had chosen to identify as Keith. That was my big mistake. As a direct result of that, and inevitably, the self-hatred of separateness, um, I'm going to try and manage the world in order to not have to look at my self-hatred as an ego, the guilt. And I'm going to do that by picking out uh, people that are most suitable to be special hate partners, <laughs> uh, where I can go, the evil is in you. It's not in me at all. Look at you. You're the devil. You're the bad one. You're the evil one. You're the one God's going to punish. So we love to have figures like Hitler and Stalin and Putin and whatever. We love that. The guilt is not in me. It's in them. So that's our special hate. That's our way of managing the guilt because the first mistake I made was I chose to be a separate self. The guilt is intolerable. Now I need to find people to put the guilt into instead of me and go, you're the one, you're the reason that being an ego is awful. Uh, and then the second thing we do is we seek out special love partnerships. And again, this is a way of managing how much I hate myself as an ego. Unconscious, of course, it's the unconscious hatred of myself for what I did to God, for destroying heaven to be me. And so now I will pick out friendships and I will pick out relationships. And now we will create a, a special relationship bargain where it's like, well, I'm incomplete and I hate myself. And what I need now is something from the outside that's going to fill me up. And so I'm going to form a friendship or a relationship with you. And you are going to behave in a certain way towards me. You are going to respect me and honor me. And you're going to do this so that I don't have to look at how awful I believe I am. And in return, I'm going to do this for you. So you don't have to look at what you think about yourself. So that's the special relationship bargain. And the minute my special relationship partner stops fulfilling their end of the bargain, all my self-hatred comes back up again. And again, the nature of projection means I'm going to take no responsibility for the fact that that was always inside of me because I've chosen to be this separate thing. And I'm going to now feel this self-hatred coming up, this inadequacy coming up, and I'm going to go, you did this to me. Look what you've done to me. Okay, so that's the first mistake is I identify as a separate self. And then the second inevitable thing is I'm going to try and manage my self-hatred in my special love and special hatred bargains. Okay, so to, to finish off the story then in terms of how I correct my mistake here in trying to do forgiveness, I step back and I look at the fact that I'm choosing to be Keith and I forgive it. 
Now I'm looking at the fact that I'm choosing to be Keith and therefore wanting to write to TripAdvisor <laughs> and wanting to make smart comments about pressing the button for my coffee in the morning. I look at the fact that I'm choosing that and I don't judge it. I am forgiving the fact that I'm choosing to be Keith. And as I do that, this beautiful energy of peace and forgiveness and non-judgment arises in my mind. I am not fighting my decision to be Keith. I'm not trying to change it. I'm not trying to beat myself over the head with the course like I was in the beginning. Instead, I'm allowing this beautiful mm -hmm. energy of forgiveness and non-judgment into my mind. And I'm doing that by allowing the decision I'm making for Keith and not judging it. I'm forgiving it. I'm looking at it with no judgment. And now this beautiful alternative energy arises in my mind, which is also an alternative identity. And if I keep looking at what I'm doing for what it is, not the way I'm setting it up, <laughs> that I'm causing all my own problems by deciding to be Keith, um, and I'm looking at it and I'm forgiving it, not fighting it, not trying to change it. I'm forgiving it, forgiving the fact that I don't want to forgive because I'm deciding to be Keith. As I do that, this alternative energy just grows in your mind. And at some point, you are going to automatically disengage from identifying as a separate self and identify with the peace and stillness in your mind. That's why Jesus emphasizes over and over and over again, you don't do forgiveness yourself. You bring the darkness to the light. What's the darkness? your separate self and what it's inevitably going to be doing. Uh, and what's the light? Forgiveness of it. Non-judgment of it. So this is the, the most difficult thing for us to lock into our mind is that I don't, as the separate self, try and forgive. Instead, what I do is I am that which can look at the decision for the separate self with no judgment. Um, or should I say, yeah, and, and, and then as I do that, this alternative identity just grows in my mind. Now, listen, it could take two minutes for me to just simply identify with this forgiving presence in my mind instead of what's being forgiven. It might take two minutes. It might take two hours. It could take two days. But forgiveness is still and quietly does nothing. It merely looks and waits and judges not. So I don't do forgiveness. It happens automatically um, when I switch from identifying as Keith, the thing that's inevitably upset, the separate thing, to this forgiving presence in my mind, which is presence only because I'm not judging Keith. It should be automatic. It's not, we don't try and shoehorn ourselves into the holy instant. So the holy instant is that moment where you choose to have the Holy Spirit's interpretation uh, rather than your ego identity's interpretation. That's the holy instant. And if you try and shoehorn yourself into it and go, now I'm going to forgive, abracadabra, now it's gone, um, it's not going to work. Because you're trying to do it as an ego and egos can't forgive. They can only judge. And even when they're fooling themselves that they are forgiving, it's a judgment. It's behold me, the spiritualized ego, and how good I am that I've let this go. <laughs> Aren't I wonderful? Um, and that's not forgiveness, that's judgment. <laughs> what you did was awful, but look, behold my judgment, all is well. <laughs> um, that's the trap. And that's why forgiveness to destroy is pretend forgiveness. Because I'm saying, well, you did do it. But because I am this wonderful course student, I'm able to forgive that. And I'm very pleased with myself now that I've managed to forgive what you did. That's forgiveness to destroy. Instead of what forgiveness is, which is disidentifying as an ego and identifying as this forgiving, non-judgmental presence in my mind, which has never been affected by anything bodies did, not my body or anyone else's body. I'm forgiving what never happened. I only thought it happened because I was identifying as the separate thing. But I've remembered I'm not the separate thing. I'm this, which is vulnerable. 
nothing to touch what I am here. Okay, so we will explore that uh, from the point of view of two other stories, but I think at this stage we'll throw it open to some questions. So um, I'll get Sally maybe to have a quick scour if there's anything I need to answer in the chat box, and anyone else can put their hands up uh, for some clarification if they want it. So where shall we start, Sally? Okay, so uh, Marina uh, in the chat asked uh, during your discussion about your forgiveness opportunity, Mm -hmm. So, Keith, was your projection the attack thoughts you had towards the lady, not the lady's behavior towards you? That was okay. the question. Um, yeah. Um, so Jesus says in the course, if I defend myself, I am attacked. And that goes to the core of the question that Maureen is asking there. Um, how am I attacked if I defend myself? Because I have attacked the Christ in me what I am in the cinema with Jesus, that beautiful, forgiving, non-judgmental, peaceful presence in my mind, which is what I really am, well, at least my right mind itself, I have attacked that in order to identify as a separate self. And now what we, 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 we only um, defend illusions, okay? We, we, the truth needs no, no defense, all right? So the minute then I am like, you know, you have disrespected me, you have embarrassed me. Um, well, who's the me that I'm defending? It's the ego. So I have attacked what I am, my right mind identity and the Holy Spirit in order to identify as a separate self. And now I am defending that separate self as though it's what I am. So I've attacked myself. So that's the important thing. We always attack ourselves first. If I haven't attacked myself, then, you know, I, I can't be upset. <laughs> I have nothing to yeah. defend. Can I, Does that can make I sense, just Marina? say this? Mm, yeah. yeah, but my question was the projection process, because we are talking about uh, projections, and I'm struggling with this. When you talk about we project, is not the... Um, how do I put this? It's not the lady, you project the actual lady who then attacks you. The projection is this lady is neutral for what I understand so far about the course. The lady is neutral, her behavior is neutral. The projection is your um, attack thought on the lady. Am I, am I clear? I don't know yes. if I did yes. this. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, okay, so, so here's, here's what's happening in that situation. I have attacked my identity in the Holy Spirit to identify as an ego, a separate self called Keith. So I, that's the first attack. And now someone has done something in the movie. Now, Jesus says, um, nothing I see means anything at all. That's what you mean by neutral. Nothing I see means anything at all. It's just a movie, okay? Um, um, I have given everything I see all the meaning that it has for me. So as an ego, I will now decide on the meaning that that has. But there okay. is any reason why this lady showed up. <laughs> why, did show, why did she show up in... For you to go into this yeah, ego it's, trait. Okay, and I promise I'll answer that, but I'm going to have to answer it in a separate way, right? Because it's the same as asking, why did people show up and demand Jesus be tortured to death? And why, when they were given the opportunity of having him released, why did they shout for Barabbas, the mass murderer, to get released instead of him? And why um, did people show up to nail Jesus to a cross with a crown of thorns on his head um, and hang him there until he sucked it? Right. Well, yes, this is my question. Time. This is okay. exactly my so, question. Yeah. So, so I'm going to answer that separately, right? But okay. let me answer it this way first of all, um, because that's not such an important um, thing to be aware of. It's, it's metaphysically interesting, and I'm going to deal with it in a second. But let me talk about what's important. There, there is a movie of separateness where guilt is seen, where sin and guilt is seen outside in the movie. And um, and once, so we made the movie as an attack on God, okay, to get away from God and um, to keep our separateness. And 
it's not someone else's to blame. Um, but once we've made the movie, the movie's neutral because it's an illusion. Illusions aren't good or bad or right or wrong. It's just an illusion. Uh, and that's what the neutral means, right? However, now that I have identified as the separate self, Keith, um, and this is what Jesus means by I see only the past. So when this woman in the movie <laughs> does come along and behaves in a certain way, um, it stirs up my guilt. Now, from the perspective of the separate self, the guilt that gets getting stirred up for me is all the times that my teachers gave out to me in the wrong, all the times I felt embarrassed about myself when I was a child. Um, and so when that behavior happens outside of myself, it brings up all of this old stuff that's inside of me. Mm. And now I feel awful. And now I don't want to deal with all that awfulness because this is how bad I feel about myself. This is my shame. This is my embarrassment. This is my um, sense of inadequacy. Um, and, and I can't handle it. So what I need to do is I need to get angry with someone else and say, you did this to me. This is not how I feel about myself. You did it to me. Okay, now, that's what's going on from the perspective of this illusory self, right? <laughs> um, however, I don't need to get in touch with every time a teacher gave out to me in the wrong or my parents were unfair towards me or I was embarrassed or made to feel shown up. Or I don't need to get in touch with that, right? I don't. All I need to understand is that all of those times uh, the feeling that came up in me was the guilt over being separate from God and what we did to God. Okay, so there's a part in the psychotherapy uh, pamphlet where Jesus says, um, you know, if you look enough, um, you'll see um, the exact type of unforgiveness that has caused you to manifest a physical symptom. Um, an example off the top of my head. So, you know, one of your legs is lame. And if you look enough, you'll find a situation where you don't feel like you're able to stand up for yourself. Now, he says that in the psychotherapy pamphlet, right? Um, however, he also says, um, but that's not going to work. <laughs> okay, that's not going to work. It's not going to get you anywhere. It's not going to accomplish anything. Um, because the only thing that will work is forgiveness. So I do not have to go into my mind going, where is the situation where I didn't, I don't feel like I can stand up for myself. Uh, instead, all I do is I forgive whatever situation is in front of me. That's all I do. I, I deny its ability to take my peace from me in the Holy Spirit. And that fixes everything. So that's what Jesus means when he says we don't have to chase through the circuitous roots of the ego um, in order to know, you know, oh, this was the thing that, you know, happened with my uncle when I was five years old. And this is why blah, 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 blah. we don't need to do that. Um, the only thing that's asked of you is that you forgive what's in front of you. And that means you deny its ability to take your peace from you. My problem, if I can say this, is that I don't even know this guilt. I don't even, I am not even aware I have all this guilt inside of me. And this is a real struggle for me. Yeah, but the, you and everyone else, we've set it up that way, Marina. Here's my other question. Do you find politicians guilty? Yes. Okay, that's your guilt. Okay, it's hidden in other people. That's everyone, all right? So you're saying, well, I don't feel guilty. No, of course you don't, because you see it in everyone else instead of yourself. <laughs> I speak. That's why we made the world. That's why we made the world. There's only one of us here. Okay, so um, to answer your other question, Marina, um, which is about what causes the person to show up, um, Whenever I talk about forgiveness, I always say that the world's going to happen and it is apparently, so in the group, I'll always put in brackets beforehand, I'll say apparently stirring up the guilt inside of you. 
and that it's your savior because now you know about the guilt and you can have it undone, right? But I always say apparently because in the dream, um, cause and effect are reversed. And so it seems like something, someone has done something with the coffee machine <laughs> and made me feel like a old school boy. And because of that, my guilt has come up. In actual fact, that guilt is the reason someone did that with the coffee machine. So in the dream, cause and effect, which are one, cannot be separate. Cause and effect are not only separate, but they're reversed. Cause looks like effect and effect looks like cause. Um, so that's so that's the thing. So, I mean, when <laughs> the fact that's why the world's going to give me exactly what I need. Um, it's going to seem that way because the guilt in my mind means I have wrote with the ego a particular script where I will be unfairly treated. And then I'm going to encounter the script and go, oh, my God, I'm unfairly treated. Behold my upset. <laughs> OK, but but I wrote the script to disguise the upset and it's not my fault to get rid of the guilt for it. And so when I look at the world from wrong-minded consciousness, which is identification with form, uh, it seems like the world is doing it to me because that's how I set it up. But if I look from right-minded consciousness, um, what I see is that the world is doing that because of the guilt inside of me and I wanted the world to do it. And is it possible this is our uh, curriculum, the Holy Spirit sent to us? Because I, I remember I read something somewhere in the in the text that the Holy Spirit sends you. Uh, yes, now your, be very your... careful how we understand that. Okay, so the right. thing is, remember, from wrong-minded consciousness and ego, I wrote a script so that my self-hatred could be visited on people outside of myself and I'll hate them instead of hating me. So we wrote the script, okay? We wrote the script. Now, but the script, so the script is perfect. So I can feel like the innocent victim instead of the victimizer. Uh, I can feel hard done by instead of the evil one. Uh, and so I can be without my guilt. So the script is perfect for that. Okay, that's the script seen from wrong-minded consciousness. But if I look from right-minded consciousness, which is the Holy Spirit, then my guilt that I did not want to look at, and exactly like your question a moment ago, uh, which I cannot undo because I don't know about it, like you said a moment ago, if I look from right-minded consciousness, now I see that my guilt is shining in the script that I wrote, exactly where I put it. So the Holy Spirit doesn't write a script. It's like the Holy Spirit repurposes the script you wrote so you would see your guilt in everyone else apart from yourself. And in when I look at it from the Holy Spirit, this is perfect because all I have to do is forgive the guilt in everyone else that I put there. And I've forgiven myself. So the Holy Spirit doesn't write a script. The Holy Spirit asks that you would look at the script you wrote so you could be an innocent victim with him um, and forgive it. And what you're forgiving, when you forgive the world, you've forgiven yourself and the world disappears. My God. So does that make sense, Marina? <laughs> I have to elaborate on this. Okay, thank okay. you very much, Keith. Yeah. So we wrote the script and it's perfect because the guilt I don't want to look at is shining in everyone else and I don't have to look at it. If I look at it with the Holy Spirit, now I can forgive my guilt, which is shining in everyone else where I put it, and I've forgiven myself and undone the separation. So the, the script is just repurposed. The Holy Spirit turns the tables on the ego because the fatal flaw in the ego script is that the guilt I hid from myself is hidden in plain sight. It's in everyone else apart from myself. So by you forgiving politicians, you're forgiving your own guilt. So we leave that one with you, Marina. And do we have anything else in the chat box? Um, we do. 
Oh, yes, we do from Sherry G. Um, okay. Keith, do you share with your husband that you are doing this forgiveness with the coffee lady or do you just keep it quiet? No, I don't. I mean, he is a shameless Catholic <laughs> and has <laughs> zero interest in A Course in Miracles or anything I do. And, uh, you know, we get 20,000 views on YouTube every month and he has never listened to me speak for more than like <laughs> a minute. Uh, in fact, even if I was editing or listening or something, he would go turn that down. <laughs> <laughs> so my husband has absolutely zero interest in anything I'm doing spiritually, and I don't need him to have any interest in it at all. Um, you know, people say to me all the time, oh, I need to have a partner that's more interested. No, you don't. Because, you know, spirituality is what you do with your mind. It's got nothing to do with anyone else in the world. It's what you're doing with your mind. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, that keeps me grounded. <laughs> Stops me becoming a balloon. Um, anything else in the chat box, Sally? Yes, there is. There's one more thing. And this is from Shannon Raymond. Um, I feel like I need to hear the course's definition of forgiveness over and over as my former understanding of the word keeps tripping me up. Is there a good substitute word or phrase to help me uh, get this? Yeah. Forgiveness is looking at your ego without judging it, without making a big deal out of it. That's what forgiveness is. And the problem is we keep making a big deal out of it. That's where we go wrong. So I'm like, here I am feeling livid, <laughs> having been scolded like a schoolboy. And it's like, oh, my God, I shouldn't be feeling like this. I've got to fix this. Let me do a forgiveness process to get. Beyond. So I'm making a big deal out of it. And that's where I go wrong. Because all I have to do is non-judgmentally look, which is what forgiveness is, which is what awareness is. Non-judgmental looking is awareness. And so all I have to do is notice the fact that I'm choosing to be an ego and not make a big deal out of it. And the minute I do that, this alternative consciousness arises inside of me, this presence, this peace. Not by fighting my choice for the ego, but by forgiving it. And then when I'm ready, I will shift my allegiance from the separate self to this alternative presence in my mind, which is just a lovely, forgiving, gentle, um, non-opposing um, peace, which is the Holy Spirit. And so whenever, here's the thing, whenever you look at something, whether it's your own ego or someone else's ego or something in the world, whenever you look with no judgment, you're holding hands with the Holy Spirit. You have to be. Because your ego cannot look at anything without labeling it and judging it and saying whether it's good or it's bad or it's better or it's worse or whatever. So the minute you look at anything, the world or your decision to be an ego, the minute you look at it with no judgment, you are you are with the Holy Spirit. You have to be. Because the ego, it's the one thing the ego can't do. It cannot just look without judgment. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so forgiveness is looking at your ego without judging it. That's what it is. And then you get to identify as what looks at your ego with no judgment. And guilt cannot stand against that presence. Upset cannot stand when you mark that as what you are. So I hope that makes sense. Um, anything else in the chat box, Sally? Uh, one more, and this is from Florence, and she wants mm -hmm. to know, is fear the same as guilt? Yes. So um, it's sin, guilt, and fear is the unholy triad. It's a bit like the ego's equivalent of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, and so um, sin, guilt, and fear. Sin is that I have I have separated from God in the past. I have attacked him so I could be a separate self and me outside of oneness. I've destroyed oneness for it. That's the sin. Um, the guilt is what I inevitably feel based on what I now believe I have done to the source of all love and goodness in the universe. And fear is the punishment I now deserve. And it's coming. God's going to come. He's not going to take this line down. There's a, there's a part in the course that says, um, um, think not he has forgotten. Think not God has forgotten what you did to him. Now, that's obviously all made up. 
we made up sin, guilt, and fear because the separation never happened, but we needed separation to be real because we had chosen the ego and to protect separateness. Uh, we made up this story that, you know, God was attacked and that I needless to say, feel awful about it. And I am now terrified that he's, you know, let me not think, let me think not that he has forgotten he's coming going to restore his oneness by taking back from me the life I believe I've stolen from him. But it's all made up. So yeah, sin, guilt, and fear. Same thing. Okay, so um, shall we go to the hands? Who Would, would you know who's first, Sally? I would. It would be Sharon of New Jersey. Hi. Hi, Sharon. Good to see you. Hi, thank you. Uh, I really never understood the course until I stumbled on this Facebook group. And I just appreciate that. However, now I'm going to complain uh -huh. because <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't relate at all. Oh, I, I mean, that could be not true. But to finding special hate outside of myself because I have almost continually awareness of special hate toward myself. Constant failure. And it originated with it. What I feel is a huge failure to, for, to my father who I identify as perfect, unconditional love. I know he's, it, it's almost blasphemy for me to think, wait, he's not, it's not all combined into a person. But somehow I've fused the whole idea of unconditional love with one person that's been dead for a long time mm -hmm. that I ended up placing in a nursing home and felt like I did it. Uh, so I, I know I'm going around a certain book, Oh, no, take your time. Go ahead. Sorry. But I wanted to um, just say I seem to always be beating up on myself. Now, something you said really got me. And uh, I just want to know, I know I'm so abnormal, but I, I guess I'm looking for comfort of someone to say it's OK. It's the same thing. And I heard you say, um, Forgive myself for not wanting to forgive the coffee lady. Okay. Yeah. So I'd like to insert, and I had this, it felt very light when you said that. Because Good, I just, that's the right I, feeling. I instantly applied it. I need to forgive myself for not forgiving myself. Yes. I'm just wondering, does this make sense? Is it, yes. am I thinking correctly? Please say yes, because I felt very light. I, so, I, so yes, I, I've said yes twice. And I, and okay. I do it with I'm no reservations. And, and I do it with no reservation, Sharon, because when you feel that lightness in your mind, it's the Holy Spirit. Oh, I feel good now. I know. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and that lightness is awareness. That lightness is your right mind. That lightness is the Holy Spirit. So people tie themselves in not going, I don't know if I can get this awareness. I don't know if I can feel myself as a non judgmental observer. That lightness is the answer. It happens the minute you forgive your ego. Yes, and it doesn't mean my ego's any different. No. I mean, I still hate myself, but I'm forgiving yeah. myself, hating myself, and that lightens it. Okay, but we, we, need to, we need to kind of qualify that out a little bit, right? What's happening yeah. is you want to stay Sharon um, with with the self hatred of being an ego, right? That's what you're choosing to do, right? It's like, yes. well, I'm I want to choose to be Sharon, and I'm going to hate myself, right? Um, and so what you're doing is, you're not forgiving yourself for hating yourself. <laughs> you're forgiving yourself for wanting to be the ego Sharon, full of hatred. Yes. You're not Sharon, but you're forgiving yourself for wanting to be Sharon instead of awareness. Oh, that's very beautiful. Okay, so that's the thing. Okay. And, and I the... want my father to be, oh, I'm, I don't mean to interrupt you. So. Well, let's talk about your father for a second, right? Let's talk about a passage from the course. This is from chapter 28, section okay. four, paragraph nine. 
I thank you, Father, knowing you will come to close each little gap that lies between the broken pieces of your Holy yes. Son. Now, the broken pieces is what we've done. Remember, we want it to be mindless. So this one separated son shattered himself into gazillions of pieces. This is the broken pieces and projected himself apparently out into a world. OK. So I thank you, Father, that you will come to close each little gap that lies between the broken pieces of your Holy Son. Your holiness, complete and perfect, lies in every one of them. And they are joined because what is in one is in them all. How holy is the smallest grain of sand when it is recognized as being part of the completed picture of God's Son? The forms, the broken pieces seem to take mean nothing, for the whole is in each one, and every aspect of the Son of God is just the same as every other part. So yeah. you see, when we are mindless, when we are identified as Sharon or Keith, the mindless thing, the broken piece, OK, now we want to carve the world up into the good people and the bad people and the holy people and the unholy people and the useful people and the not useful people. OK, and that's all <laughs> nonsense. OK, that's all nonsense. There's a movie playing. Right. And none of it is the son of God. The, 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 the wind, the, the mirror never shattered. There's no broken pieces. <laughs> Okay, um, there is just Christ. There is just God's holy, innocent son shining behind the movie of broken pieces. Okay, so so I, I want you just to look at the fact that you're saying my father was unconditional love. And what you're saying is that broken piece was different than me as a broken piece. And it's not because there's no broken pieces because there's no you and your dad. That's the mindless things. That's the broken pieces, right? There is one Christ. There is one son of God. And it is shining as the truth behind the movie of the broken pieces. Does that make sense? Yes, I think I've got it now, right, George. I give myself for seeing useful and useless pieces. Mm -hmm. I forgive myself for seeing it that way, for wanting to see it that way. I forgive myself for seeing myself as completely lost without that one piece. Thank you. I think I got it. Thank you. And the part of your mind that's forgiving you for wanting to be a broken piece and see all the other broken pieces <laughs> is the son of God that's never shattered. So when you said, when I forgave myself like that, I felt lighter, that lightness, that is the son of God that never shattered. That is your right-minded self. It was never shattered. Now, it doesn't mean you're not, doesn't mean you're not going to go back to identifying as the broken piece, but just so you know, you're not the broken piece. That lightness that came into your mind when you forgave yourself for wanting to be the broken piece, that is your right mind itself. And that is my right mind itself. And that is Sally's right mind itself. And that is everyone's right mind itself because there's only one right mind. The ego is legion, but the Holy Spirit is one. You are that lightness. Oh, okay. I I know I right now it's like, oh, I want to get back to that. But I know that's... And you see, and no, 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 and that seems difficult, right? And it's not. All you have to do is look at the fact that you are now back identifying as Sharon and believing that you're lacking. And you look at your decision to be Sharon and you forgive it. And the lightness is back. Do it. Yeah. Felt that. So the minute you go, I'm lacking, I need something, you have one mistake, which is that you've chosen to be Sharon. And all you do yes. is look at your decision to be Sharon without judging yourself and the likeness is back. Oh, this takes a lot of vigilance, but I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, hmm. Where shall we go next, Sally? Okay, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing this correctly. Alan, 
uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, stage is yours. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Awesome. Hey. Um. So, all right. Here's my question. If if this ego, this separate self, this me that I've apparently been identifying, choosing to identify as, isn't real, then how can it have chosen anything? It didn't. It didn't. You see. And if it didn't, then what did? What's real and why would what's real have ever chosen against itself? Does that, you see where I'm getting with that? Like, how is there- Okay, the, ultimate, I, okay, the it, ultimate answer to that is it never did. Um, so the first important thing to understand is that the separation never happened, okay? Um, that's the first important thing to understand. And so what, you are, and I am not talking about Alan because there's no Alan or Keith, right? What you really are is a oneness joined as one with God for all eternity, and that has never changed and never will. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what's true, right? Yeah. Um, again, I'm not saying that to Alan because there's no Alan. In other words, what you are um, apparently thinks it is something it's not. And that ends up being Alan when you come all the way down the stairs, right? But 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 the, but none of that's true. Separation isn't real. I get that. Okay. But what I still don't get <clears throat> is again, if it's not real and it never happens, then how then why is what is real? Like how why would that? Why would, if I'm, if what's real is that I'm spirit, just like you, just like everyone here, just like everyone in the world, parent world, why, again, like, why would that have ever chosen against itself to begin with? It didn't. So um, here's, here's just um, an illustration, um, a parable, right? If I say to you, um, what's it like? to walk the streets of the lost city of Atlantis. Um, you have no idea. You don't know if there was an Atlantis or if there wasn't an Atlantis. The only thing you know is that it's not possible for you to walk the streets of Atlantis, right? But, but I'm going, but what if you could? Mm -hmm. Okay. And all you can do is you can have a daydream about the streets in Atlantis. You can imagine what Atlantis would have looked like. And then what you can do is you can insert an imaginary you into the daydream of what Atlantis would be like. And that imaginary you can walk the streets of the imaginary Atlantis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, on the one hand, you could say, well, I've had an experience of walking down the streets of Atlantis, but you didn't <laughs> because... The, the, the daydream wasn't real. It's not possible for you to walk the streets of Atlantis. And the you that was walking those streets isn't really you. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Okay. So into eternity, where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. Okay. So this was not a rebellion in heaven, right? <laughs> this was not, um, let's overthrow God. Um, let's get the hell out of Dodge. Let's do our own thing, right? That is not what happened. What happened was an idea emerged in oneness, which was, what would it be like if there was no oneness? If there was an opposite to oneness? What if there was a me that wasn't God? Okay. Now, again, and the answer is, and the Holy Spirit gave the answer straight away, it's impossible. <laughs> it can't happen. Okay. But there was a daydream. What would it be like if it did happen? And an imaginary self, and, that, and this cannot happen to Christ. Christ simply cannot, the same way Alan cannot know herself in the streets of Atlantis. She must have a daydream and put an imaginary version of herself into the daydream. In the same way, Christ cannot have an experience of being separate from God. 
or being an individual or being separate. It's impossible. But there's a thought like your daydream and an imaginary self called consciousness is inserted into the daydream to have an experience of what separateness is like. However, this is just a daydream which is not reality. Separateness is impossible. And the self that's walking the streets of the world, <laughs> experiencing itself as separate, consciousness is itself illusory. And therefore, God and Christ are oneness joined of, as one now as they have ever been and as they ever will be. Hmm. And the only problem we have is that we think we're the figure of the dream. But we're not. Can you, you see who, the parallel between the two? Yeah. How is it that that happens? Like, what is that? What is that? That what it what is it that gets pulled into believing in that dream and and not the and dream not character? Believing? So it's like you're having this daydream about what would it be like to experience the impossible, and you insert an imaginary version of yourself into the dream to experience the impossible. And then it's like, once you've done that, you forget your Alan you're sitting dead, on this yeah. chair. And now you think you actually are in Atlantis and that you're a separate self that's in it. And the only thing that's necessary is for you to stop believing that you're this character in Atlantis. And the minute you do, you come out of the daydream and nothing ever happened. Okay, but who is stopping the believing in the dream? Who is stopping the believing in the dream? Right, you said all that you need to do is stop believing in the dream that you that you're that you're somehow believing that you are now, right? You're having mm -hmm. this dream mm -hmm. that you're walking down the streets of Atlantis, and somehow in that process, something becomes identified with that and believes it's real. That's what I guess that's what I'm asking. Who yeah, and that's you? consciousness. Hmm. OK, and that's why when consciousness seems to split, in other words, there is God and Christ as a oneness joined as one. And then there is an apparent separation that takes place, but it's not. It's just a daydream and, and a pretend self is inserted into the daydream. And now it seems like it's happened. OK, because I'm I think I'm consciousness. Um, however, consciousness now splits and one side of consciousness says I'm in the dream. Uh, or, or actually, this is reality. One side of consciousness goes, this is reality. I am a separate self in Atlantis. And then, but remember, consciousness is split. And another side is saying, this isn't true. You're not this. And that's the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. But the so that so, all, so all that has to happen is for consciousness to stop listening to the ego, which is saying, you are this separate self in Atlantis. And all it has to do is listen to the part of the mind saying, this is just a daydream and it's not true. Okay. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, what you're saying. And, makes once, and once right-minded consciousness um, wins out and it's like, none of this is real. Then what happens is all of consciousness is undone and you are what you've always been. Hmm which is spirit. So it's only seeming to be that, right. that it's being believed yeah. that the Alan actually exists and is yeah. having suffering and yeah. all of that. But all of that, all of it is just imagined. It's yeah. none of it is real. None. Even though, yeah, even though in the dream, <laughs> it seems to, it can seem very real, it can seem... Yes have consequences um and that's why jesus says actually... you travel but in dreams while safe at home mm. and so that's what awakening is essentially yeah so there's um there's only two thoughts now out of those two thoughts come two different thought systems but there's only two thoughts one thought is the thought of separateness and that it's real and the mm. other thought is no it's not real Okay. So, 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 so the entire ego thought system and the world is born out of the idea separateness is real, but it's not. 
it, so mind blowing. It, yeah, Alan doesn't. Alan doesn't get it, but it, no. something here definitely gets that. Yes, the why That's it. Alan will never get it. Again, Jesus says, you know, think not that you can bring truth to fantasy and understand truth from the perspective of fantasy, uh, and you can't. Um, you know, uh, truth only makes sense from its from itself from from truth itself um and so and so again we have one problem which is identifying with the movie character <laughs> and there is one solution to everything which is to undo that mistaken identity and all you do is you look at yourself choosing the mistaken identity without judging yourself a peace and a forgiveness and a non-judgment will arise in your mind as a result of that that's your that's the party that's not alan yeah it's the party that knows there's no separateness. It's the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Um, where should we go next then, Eli? Or Eli, <laughs> Sharon, <laughs> Sally. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry, Sally. Uh, Mona, um, you're next. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi. Hi, Mona. <laughs> oh, I don't see you. There you are. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. It's not really a question, Keith, so I don't know if you would indulge me to share a forgiveness experience I had Go ahead. Uh, several days ago that might be a practical example of what you're talking about. You okay with that? Okay. You go ahead. Yeah, so the day we were, the lesson of the day was, you know, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. So in my practice in the morning, I ask the Holy Spirit, well, show me, show me what is that in my defenselessness, my safety lies. Later that day, I was in a course meeting and I was feeling peaceful. I'm in my peaceful state, feeling connected. And towards the end of the meeting, um, somebody came and confronted me about something they thought I did. <laughs> as soon as, while i'm standing there in utter peace okay keith i was completely in utter peace i immediately recognize the hands of the holy spirit in this arrangement <laughs> you see what i'm saying and i didn't feel anything other than peace the entire time this person was i don't even remember what was said to be honest with you all I saw was someone who's calling for help, for love, calling for love, right? And eventually this person, because I was not responding at all, I was just looking, uh, it fizzled out the argument, right? Whatever argument. And um, he even apologized. <laughs> Without me saying anything, he apologized. And then the only thing that I was... Um, guided to say is do you want a hug mm -hmm. and we hugged yep. okay so that sounds really good it's now i get home <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh i get home and i am reading my my the course of miracles book and he's as far as i'm concerned he was out of my mind completely right but as I'm reading, he kept popping in my mind. And I'm like, get away here. I've already dealt with this, right? Let's look again. So I'm trying to read and he keeps popping in my mind. Finally, I said, okay, there's something here <laughs> I got to look at, right? So I closed the book and I, this is what I've been using lately, which I'm loving. So I closed my eyes and I just said, into Christ's presence, I enter now. And I said, show me. Like, show me what this is that is, you know, needs to come up. And Keith, <laughs> what I saw right here in the pit of my stomach, right? This dark grayish monster that was screaming, I was affronted. <laughs> I was affronted. Now I am with Jesus in a pure state of peace and just observing and basically smiling or giggling a little bit. You know, I'd admit I did that because it is like, I was affronted. And then when it did not get a response from me because it was trying to get me, you know, to get affronted, right? Since I did not respond, it went into murderous rage. 
I've heard that term never in my entire life thought that that is that I could even imagine what a murderous rage is. This thing, this little grayish monster started ripping that other person apart. Ah, ah, I mean, completely enraged, enraged. And when I did not answer, I just stayed in that stillness. It went into murderous range towards me. Now it's shredding me apart, right? I did not respond. I stayed in that state and just watched this insanity. I mean, it's complete insanity. And all I could do is laugh at it, right? And before you know it, it just fizzled out, fizzled out, and then turned into puff smoke and disappeared. <laughs> And I came out of that feeling, ah, that's done. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So the, I the haven't key, had it done that way. No, you know the what key I'm saying? Thing there is the ego isn't you. No, that's it's thing. not me. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, Mona is not what you are, and Keith is not nope. what I am. Um, nope. and, and our job is not to fix Mona or change Mona or fight mm -hmm. Mona or do anything. Our job is to step back and not be Mona by witnessing Mona. Yeah. With no judgment, by forgiving the decision mm -hmm. to be Mona. And that's all we're asked to do. Yeah. Forgiveness is still, and it does nothing. It merely and looks that's, and waits. That and was not. incredible because, you know, in the past, I've used words to forgive. We've yeah. all done that. Like in your mind, I forgive you for whatever you might have done to me. I forgive myself for whatever I've done. Mm -hmm. I've done that plenty of times, but it kept coming up, kept, kept coming up. So there is something that needs to be looked at like you said and this last this experience really demonstrated true forgiveness to me yeah what true yeah. forgiveness is yeah and i was like blown away by it i'm like oh okay so even though i was in my peace state when i was confronted and by the way the, the confrontation was really gentle i mean it wasn't mm -hmm. like you know i'm gonna kill you kind of thing yes. <laughs> it was very gentle in the scheme of things right i stayed in that state of peace did not feel triggered at all right but the ego is so sneaky and it was hiding in there mm -hmm. knowing that i'm in a state of peace so let's disrupt her now yeah once i moved away from that situation <laughs> in days. In days. i just wanted to share that i hope it helps thank you you I know to have like an, yeah. the imagery and the experience and how it's done and, and I'm not saying is, this is how it's going to be for every person, you know. No, it changes all the time. It exactly. changes all the time. We have deeper yep. and deeper experiences of forgiveness. We definitely yeah. do. Um, even Jesus yeah. says that in the course to Helen at one stage. He says, you haven't yet had an experience of the holy instant, but you can benefit a lot from practicing the mechanics of it until you do. Um, yes. And, and a lot of our time in the beginning is practicing the mechanics of this until we have something like this where it mm -hmm. just like, blows you away like you know yeah so you're like wow and, and again, this the, is forgiveness yeah and the trick is we have two selves and you don't have to get rid of your ego self you just nope. have to look at it, it just without goes judging poof. It. yeah you just gotta look <laughs> not at it that the ego it. went poof Forgiving I, I it, not clear. taking it seriously <laughs> yes. and by doing that you get to experience as the lovely forgiving forgiving presence in your mind which is your second self so it's perfect yeah, yeah. so i just want to be clear that it wasn't the ego that went poof it was the darkness about whatever this represented that went poof the reason I say that is I don't want to make it sound like I don't have an ego anymore. <laughs> I know. Yes, I know. Yeah, no, it's guilt. It's guilt. guilt yeah. Stuff. It's yes. some darkness that needed to come up and That's it. explode. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Where should we go next then, Sally? Uh, Lois, you can unmute Lois, yourself. The and, stage uh, is yours, Lois. Oh, you need to unmute yourself, Lois. So if you can. That's hi. perfect. Hi. First of all, hi. I just want to say thank you. Um, my husband passed away two weeks ago. Oh, I'm so and, sorry, Lois. And I'm sitting here watching my ego just crying all the time. Yeah. And it's and I know that I should find I'm trying to laugh at myself because I can't seem to stop crying. No, don't do that. But um, I just want to thank you guys because I don't know how I could go on. Um, 
but having you all here and listening is really helping me. So thank you. That's all I need to say now. Oh, thanks, Lois. Uh, Lo- Lois, don't don't um see the mistake is to be Lois and upset, and then as Lois try and laugh at Lois, you, you don't want to do that, right? Um, and so what you want to do is you want to um and be very gentle with yourself in this. You know, as Jesus says in the course, the only, you know, who could weep but for his innocence, uh, which is that we have thrown God away. Um, And so we made a world where there was death, where things that we would have for a while, it seemed like they were there for a while and then they would die and there would be sadness. And we made the world to cover up the fact that our real sadness is that we have thrown God away um, seemingly forever. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to be very gentle with yourself and not try and fight Lois in the slightest because, you know, we all have an ego. And if you have any semblance of an ego whatsoever, then something like that is going to be a very, very traumatic and sad experience, Lois. And you need to allow yourself to feel whatever you're feeling that's going on. And and when you're ready, um, you just want to try to not experience it on your own. Mm-hmm. Just just try to, you know, don't do it without. Don't do it without Jesus. Um, That's what I'd say to you, because you have two selves. So there's one that's Lois and you have another self that's not Lois that can be with Jesus and that can look at Lois and forgive her and not judge her. And so, you know, when in a very gentle way when you feel ready to do that practice the fact that there's Lois who is like upset and that there's another you that's not Lois and Mm -hmm. that and that other you is what Lois and your husband always was in other words Mm -hmm. you can't be separate from your husband because the same mind that's dreaming itself to be Lois is dreaming itself was dreaming itself to be your husband (laughs) I Does gotcha. That, make yeah. Yeah. that makes sense. Yes. yes. So, so when when you identify with Lois, it's going to seem like you had your husband for a period of time and then your husband died and you don't have your husband. But when you step back with Jesus, there's the experience that what you really are, that's not Lois, is also what your husband was. It's it's the son of God. And separation and death is impossible. Thank you. Yes, just try and just try and have your two selves present, Lois, whereby uh, uh, allow that, you know, remember, your job is to forgive yourself for choosing to be Lois feeling bereft. Your job is to forgive yourself for doing that. And as you're forgiving and not judging, that peace and non-judgment and love in your mind um, is the self that you and your husband really are. So it's such a gentle process. You never want to fight against upset or sadness or guilt or anything like that. You never want to fight against it. It just makes it real. All you want to do is forgive yourself that you're choosing to be the separate thing for now. Mm -hmm. And the consciousness that arises in you to forgive it is your higher self. It is your right minded self. And it's the self that we all are. Thank you so much. Bless you, Lois. Thank you. So shall we go to Shaz next, um, Sally? Yeah. Yes. And, and Lois, everybody's sending you their love and, and me as well. I see that. I could see the chat. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, Shaz. Okay. Um, I just have a bit of a share, and I think a question might come out of it. Um, sure. Um, I liked what you said about uh, spirituality is what you do with your mind and not necessarily the form and the behavior in which you live your life. Um, My question or my comments are revolve around um, sort of my pursuit with career um, because I was I was in a minister training program for three years that was structured around a course in miracles and um, I guess like I have a day job, but you know, like I'm look, I would one day maybe want to like have a ministry and I technically got ordained. So I do kind of have a ministry, but I haven't got the 
business up and running or anything. Um, and I have a lot of preoccupation about it, a lot of insecurity about wanting to do it. And some blocks that I feel are like, when I, when I read about uh, Ken's perspective on things, um, sometimes I, I get critical on myself because um, there's a lot of ego investment in this goal. And, um, you know, sometimes I wonder like, you know, do people even really want to learn this? Like, do, do, do we really even love the course because it's so radical and it's saying that our individuality is false. And um, I guess just the teachings are so radical that I feel insecure about um, like being someone who would be carrying these, this message. But then, you know, I think what you'll probably point to is that, you know, the fact that Chaz is trying to be the teacher and, um, um, you know, I was taught to like, try to let, you know, Jesus minister through me, but I found that it's very challenging to be a channel like that because there's a lot of fear and interference. Um, but, uh, I just feel like I don't really quite feel ready and I just want to keep being the student and learning more. Um, and I am learning a lot in this group and in with Keith, with you, Keith. And um, I think, you know, just trying to do forgiveness in the true sense, as opposed to forgiveness to destroy is where my lesson lies, because uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, growth that's possible around that. So I guess, do you have any like words of caution or, or not caution, but any comments on that? Yeah. Um, I, I guess, um, so I guess when I started, um, the Facebook group with the intention of just having Zooms, and I only intended the Facebook group to be something yeah. that we met and we organized, uh, the Zoom, uh, meetings. And I did that very reluctantly because I had about, I don't, can't remember how many requests I had from people after I did the Miracle Monday talks going, would really like to understand Ken's way of teaching the course a lot better. And, you know, and I understood what you said and I would love to hear you teach more of it. And I was like, I'm not doing that. Who am I to do that? I mean, I did the same thing before I did the Minimary for Monday talks. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, I'm not doing that. Um, anyhow, um, eventually I kind of felt that, um, okay, I've had dozens of people ask me to do this, so I'm going to do it. Um, I'm not going to resist it. I'm going to go where I'm led. And, and in the beginning, I sort of thought I'm doing this Um to help other people to understand the course the way I did and to maybe have the same experience that I did. Um, so this is something I'm going to do. I'm going to give back. <laughs> I'm going to give back. And that was my original thoughts on what this was going to be about. And then very quickly, I realized that was all nonsense. Um, I'm doing this for me. Um, that's who I'm doing it for <laughs> because um, because in doing this, um, it, it's just something that gives me, it's not even what I say in the group or what I say on the Zooms or any preparation work I do for anything. It's the fact that I, when I'm doing it, I am, I'm in my right mind. Which doesn't mean there's no ridiculous Keith um, yappering away in the background. Uh, but I fall back into the stillness and the changelessness, um, the forgiveness in my mind. And it doesn't really matter what I'm doing because there's no world out there. <laughs> um, what matters is that I'm connected with that. Um, and then whatever comes from that in terms of what people will understand or not or whatever, that's not in my business. That's the extension of it through me. What matters is that I'm spending as much as my day as possible, falling back from identification as an ego um, into the changelessness and the silence. And I spend so much of my time going, what's the answer to that? And, and you know, sometimes I answer things in the group and then I look at the answer and go, where the hell did that come from? I've, I've never thought of it like that before, but, you know, so I, I learn as much from the process as anyone else. So I'm doing it for me. And so the first piece of advice I'd give you would be that, um, 
if you feel drawn towards um, extending and sharing um, the experience of the right mind, of the Holy Spirit in your mind, then do it because ideas increase through sharing. So, you know, that love and peace and joy in your mind will only increase by you sharing it. Um, but the important thing is never, ever, ever take seriously what you're doing because <laughs> it's all made up. <laughs> there is no world. That's the central message that this course seeks to teach. There is no world. There is nothing to save. Um, there's nobody else out there. <laughs> Um, you know, so if, you know, if I'm talking to you, I'm not talking to Shaz, I'm just talking to the same mind, imagining it's out to be Shaz, that's imagining it's out to be me. So we're, we're only teaching and learning as that oneself all the time. And so I, I, I would say, um, definitely, I constantly, whenever I start taking what I'm doing seriously, um, that's when I need to sort of like step back and have a look at that and realize what I'm doing isn't serious at all. If I if I took what I was doing seriously, it would mean you guys are not already enlightened. It would mean that there really is a Shaz, <laughs> Chaz, and there really is a Sally, and that I need to somehow save you from that. But if I think there's a Chaz and, and, and there's a Sally, that just means it's because I think I'm Keith, and I'm not, and none of us are. Um, the right mind is always there, shining. And it's only our activity of imagining ourselves to be this separate self that veils the reality of our right mind from us. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, we might all go into something like a ministry or a teaching or something like that. We may all go in as, as an unhealed healer, <laughs> which I did in the beginning, because the unhealed healer believes I have something that they don't <laughs> and I can you know, do something for them um, that will heal them. Um, so the unhealed healer sees a problem in the world, sees himself as the solution to the problem, because he has something that the world doesn't have. And by him contributing, he's going to create healing. So that's the unhealed healer. So he makes the error real, and then he tries to fix it and be the hero with the dream. So, okay, so I definitely did that in the beginning. And so I think what I hear you saying is that you're aware there's an element of that there with, with Chaz. Um, and I think that just makes, that's just normal. <laughs> I think everyone goes into something as an unhealed healer in the beginning. But the trick would be not staying there and realizing that um, anything you're doing, the only meaning the world has is so that you learn from it how to choose against being Chaz to be the Holy Spirit, to be the right mind. That's the only meaning the world has. So so I would say, you know, take your time to fall back into that space, ask for guidance, ask for, you know, the right timing on it. And and when you feel it is, then, you know, I think Jesus is best because he says, um, Come on, Kendall, that should have brought up. This is from chapter two, section five, paragraph four. The healer who relies on his own readiness is endangering his understanding. You are perfectly safe as long as you are completely unconcerned about your own readiness, but maintain a constant trust in mine. So this is Jesus speaking as the voice of the Holy Spirit. If your miracle working inclinations are not functioning properly, um, it's always because fear has intruded on your right mindedness and has turned it upside down. Um, so again, the, the, the crucial part there, the healer who relies on his own readiness is endangering his understanding. In other words, if I identify as Keith, and going, I don't know if I'm ready or not. Uh, I'm endangering my understanding because um, I've identified as Keith. 
um, where fear seems to be a real thing only because I'm identified as an ego identity. So by Jesus saying, but maintain a constant trust in mine. Remember, you know, Jesus is the symbol we use for your own right mind, the place of light and truth in your mind. Uh, we use Jesus as a symbol for that. So really what he's saying is you fall back into that space where there's no fear and where there's no world to fix. And then you just allow love and peace and joy to extend through you. And you don't have any investment in what it's doing in the illusion because what it's doing in the illusion doesn't mean anything except that it's an indication that you've chosen the right teacher, which is the peace in your mind instead of the fear. So that's the two pieces of advice I would give you on around that. Now, I mean, look, I'm in a very, <laughs> I'm in a situation most people would kill for because I have like, you know, sort of hundreds of people in the group going, Keith, when are you going to write a book? <laughs> um, and, um, you know, most people will be sort of writing a book and then looking for a marketplace for people who might be interested in buying it. Uh, on the other hand, um, I would say I don't feel ready to write a book yet. And the reason I don't is because I every day I ask for more guidance and I ask questions and I spend time in my right mind and I understand things better and I can explain them better in the group. So if you look at how I answered questions a year ago in the group and you compare it to now, there's a much greater clarity associated with it, which reflects itself in my own greater clarity. So do I feel ready to write a book? No. Um, and, and I'm just going to trust my guidance on when the right time might be to do that. Does any of that make sense or is any of that? Oh, yeah. Sense? Yeah. I really appreciate your thoughtful response. I got a lot out of it. And um, yeah, yeah, it's just really uh, exactly what, what I needed to hear. So thank Good. you. Pleasure. OK, I did promise, but needless to say, we're running late as usual. Um, I presume there's nothing else in the chat box, Sam, Sally. We're, we're OK. For uh, I don't think so. I'm going to double check Good. here. Uh, um, uh, no, just uh, some messages to Lois. Brilliant. Um, okay. Let me just talk about the two things. I promised we would look at it from three different angles. So we're just going to quickly do that. So we had... Um, so we had this question in the group. I'm not going to give names or anything. I mean, if you're in the group, you know who asked, but just going to go with it. Um, Okay, I had a situation earlier this week where after much mind watching, etc, I decided to let someone know that I was upset by something that happened as a result of something that they were involved in. It turned out that they got upset about me saying that I was upset, and then they became defensive and so did I, until we came to a calm resolution at the end of the conversation. Afterwards, I had all the backlash of now she won't like me anymore. And all you did was just project it onto her. A mix of knowing from a course perspective that I'm never upset for the reason I think, but feeling at times in this lifetime that it is worth letting people know if they have done something that has bothered you in one way or another. And my question is, does taking back our projections mean we will never have encounters with others like this one I just had? I heard you say in one of your talks that we don't pretend that we don't see wrongdoing, um, but we see it as a call for love. In my scenario, I did feel that sense of being unfairly treated, no matter how much I looked at it. It kept coming up and up, and I decided to talk to the other person involved, and I'm not sure if that was the right thing to do. My mind creeps in then with the old chestnut of, am I going to be like a statue on a shelf if I continue with this coursework and have zero reactions to anything ever? Will I be this seemingly placid person who never has a crossword with anyone, but inside I would be seething with anger? Um, okay, so just again, we always need, what we can see straight away is the same ego Jedi mind trick, the same mindlessness that I fell for in Florence, right? <laughs> because this person asking the question has identified as the ego and wants to know how this all works from the perspective of an ego. That's the mistake. So the first thing we need to look at in a situation like this, um, it's our starting point always is to rewind projection. Um, and the way Jesus puts that in the course is, I'm never upset for the reason I think. I am not upset because of the thing I think that's upsetting me, ever. I'm never upset for the reason I think. So I just want to point out that in this question, that means that this person was not upset by what the other person did. This person was not upset by how it was handled. This person was not upset that she won't like her. This person uh, was not upset that she's a bad course student. And this person is not upset 
that the course wants her to be a statue. The only reason this person is upset, the same as any of us, is because she's choosing to be an ego identity. And once we choose to be the ego, the separate thing, the thing that means God was attacked and heaven was destroyed, if it's true, um, then we plunge into guilt and self-hatred. And that's where all the upset is. And then we're just going to project that out onto the world and say, this is why I'm upset. This is why I'm upset. It's because of this. It's because of the course. It's because of what this person did. It's because of how I handle it. No, it's not. You're upset because you've chosen to be a separate self instead of awareness and the Holy Spirit. So that's the crucial thing that we must remember in every situation is I'm not upset for the reason I think. I'm upset because I'm choosing to be an ego. Now, the thing then is you don't start fighting yourself or trying to fix that or anything. You do one thing, which is that you fall back and you forgive the fact that you're choosing to be a person instead of spirit. And as you look with no judgment, that forgiving energy in your mind becomes, you know, palpable as, as a presence, as an alternative identity. So I'm not fighting the fact that I want to be Keith and that I want to be upset about X, Y, and Z. And I want to say that's the reason. And we, we don't fight any of that. We step back and we look at the problem the way it is rather than the way we're setting it up. The problem is that I'm choosing to be an ego. The problem is not that I'm upset about what someone did and I'm upset about how I handled it and I'm upset that they might not like, no, that's nonsense. <laughs> There's only one upset and it's the upset of being the ego. So that's always our first step in forgiveness is I'm not upset for the reason I think and I step back and I forgive myself for the one mistake I'm making, the reason I'm upset, which is that I'm choosing to be a separate self. And then I'm looking to defend that separate self. So I look at the fact that I'm doing and I don't judge myself. And now the alternative identity, the Holy Spirit rises in my mind um, and it's shining because I'm looking without judgment. The right mind is there now present and now I have a choice. And all I do is I look and I wait and I judge myself not until I'm ready to fall back and identify as this loving, forgiving, non-judgmental presence in my mind and not what I'm forgiving. Um, okay. Uh, again, just to address the second aspect of the question there, which is like, you know, but what do I do in the world? And the Course never tells you what to do in the world for two reasons. One, there's no world. Jesus doesn't give a damn what you do with your illusory body and illusory worlds because he doesn't believe in it. The only thing he cares about is what you're doing with your mind and whether you're doing what you think you're doing with him or with my ego identity is key. That's the only thing he cares about. Um, and so the entire course is about learning and this takes time. This is the purification Jesus talks about. Uh, in the miracle principles this takes time but it's learning to not react to anything in the world as an ego as keith it's learning you know not acting from a place of pain and hurt and lack and need and vulnerability not acting from that but rather falling back into the changelessness and the peace in my mind the love that's there and allowing it to express itself through me, meeting the needs of the moment for everyone concerned. And to do that, I have to disengage. I have to disidentify from the raucous shrieking of my personal self. I don't have to get rid of it. I just have to not want it to be me. And again, I just, I identify as this peaceful energy that's forgiving my ego. And then I get to be this peaceful energy that's not the ego. And then from that space, I can just automatically have what's loving happen through me in the situation. But again, what's happening through me is not important. If I think it's important, I'm an unhealed healer. It is only an indication that I've chosen the right teacher. What matters um, is that I've chosen the miracle. What matters is that I've gotten into the peace in my mind. So that's that question. Um, and then we did have another question I thought was helpful.
Okay, I feel like the worst A Course in Miracles student ever. There, I've said it. I honestly feel like I'm never, ever going to get it, despite having this pervasive feeling like it's the truth. I have picked it up and put it down and left it and come back to it. And this has been going on since 2017. And here I find myself wanting to try again. I go and pick up the book, start at lesson one. And by the third day, I'm already feeling a massive resistance that says I don't want to do it. It's too hard. It's another chore I have to do. Um, is it just the case that some people can't do it? I feel vulnerable sharing this because I have read so many of your posts and you all are clearly very well versed in this thought system. So I actually feel so embarrassed about admitting this out loud. But if I don't, I'm never going to get access to the advice or the help I need. I never get that complete feeling that I want to let it go. I just haven't a clue. I just tie myself up in knots with my ignorance. I don't even understand. Uh, treat me as if I'm a complete beginner who knows absolutely nothing. I will sit back and cringe while you read this. And everyone in the group is like, I'm exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> everyone feels exactly the same because we're all trying to do it as egos. And it's impossible. It is impossible. And so, again, this was the idea of this week's masterclass is that we understand that I cannot identify as a person and then do forgiveness. That's the mistake we'll keep making over and over again. Um, and so really, um, the, the resistance in all of us is massive. The resistance to not being the insane voice talking to itself is absolutely phenomenal. And it's huge. Uh, and that's why Jesus says, you know, in lesson 185, I want the peace of God to say these words is nothing, it's nothing. But to mean these words is everything. If you could mean them for just an instant, there would be no further sorrow possible for you in any form, in any place or time. Heaven would be completely given back to full awareness. Memory of God entirely restored. The resurrection of all creation fully recognized so if anything that another body does or that happens to another body or that happens to your body or that your body does if any of that causes you sorrow you have resistance there you go that's all of us um so what jesus is saying is heaven if you could mean them I want the peace of God. And all it means is let go of the ego's hand. Stop identifying as a self. Stop identifying as a person. Identify as that peaceful, forgiving, non-judgmental presence in my mind. When, that I am when I look at my ego without judging it. And if I want the peace of God, all I ever have to do is make one last revocable decision to be that and not a person. But none of us are going to do that. It's terrifying huge resistance so we're going to have to chip away at it one miracle at a time but jesus is saying if you did that if you chose irrevocably against being an ego to be what the holy spirit is um no further sorrow would be possible for you in any form because you're not a body because you're invulnerable Heaven will be completely given back to full awareness. Memory of God entirely restored. Again, Jesus says in the Course, the memory of God comes to the quiet mind. What's a quiet mind? One that's not judging or labeling. Awareness, being awareness rather than the insane voice talking to itself. So the quiet mind doesn't have an insane voice talking to itself. And the resurrection of all creation fully recognized. What's he saying there? There's only one of us here. When I fall back from being an individual personal self and know myself as a pure non-judgmental field of awareness, what I realize is that's what everyone is. Now there's just a movie playing of people being born and dying and suffering and killing each other and killing themselves. Now there's just a movie playing and it means nothing. Because there's only this awareness. 
It was never in the movie. So when Jesus awoke from the dream of death, all apparent minds woke with him because there's only one mind. There's only one awareness. The ego is legion, but the Holy Spirit is one. Once you identify as the Holy Spirit, you realize that the glass never shattered. There was no broken pieces. So again, we're just pointing out here, we all have resistance. And we have to be very vigilant against this idea that I'm a bad Course in Miracles student, because that's how we torture ourselves as Course in Miracles students. We all have that secret fear that we're crap at this and everyone's better than we are. <laughs> Is there anyone would put their hand up and go, that's not true? <laughs> Every single one of us are like, I'm secretly crap at this. Okay. And that's resistance. Um. So again, what I really want to say about um, about this is that, you know, in terms of forgiveness formula, um, I have this bad thing has happened and I'm very angry and upset and, not, you know, I can't let it go. And what do I do about it? Nothing. Do nothing because you're identifying as a person. And the only thing a person can do is the best a person can manage is forgiveness to destroy, which is pretend forgiveness. So all you do is you fall back and you look at the fact that right now, you're choosing to be the ego. You're choosing to be the separate thing that means God was destroyed. God was attacked and heaven was destroyed. And you look at that and you don't judge it. It's all you do. And this alternative arises in your mind. So just by looking at the fact that you are choosing to be this separate self and not calling it guilty, not fighting it, not trying to change it, but forgiving it, just looking with forgiveness. And as we do that, um, as someone said earlier on, this Sharon, this lightness comes in and it does. Feel it now, right now. Just look at the fact that you're choosing to be a person. You're terrified of not being a person. And look at the fact that you're choosing to be a person and don't judge it. Just forgive yourself for the fact that you're choosing to be a person right now instead of awareness. And feel what arises in your mind. That's the Holy Spirit. That peace in your mind. That is your right mind itself. And so you don't, as the separate self, go looking for awareness. <laughs> the right mind, because you can't find it. That's the big mistake. All you do is you forgive the fact that you're choosing to be the wrong mind. And then this alternative identity rises in your mind. But you don't go looking for it. Forgiveness gives me everything I want. All right, guys, thank you very much for your attention. We've run probably later than ever, but I hope some aspects of the meeting were useful to you going forwards. And um, whatever else you do today, Sunday, make sure you are watching it from the perspective of the part of you that knows you're not there. <laughs> um, and I will chat to you all in the group. Thanks, guys. Have a lovely Sunday. Thank you. Thank, you. Great Thank you, Keith. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.